I gave my talk that rather provocative title because I do, I do feel that these three men have a lot in common and what they share, from my point of view, is that they, they are truly revolutionary in their thinking. They were all three about decentralizing power and all three of them were very aware of and promoted a spiritual approach. And that's rather unusual. Uh, they were all three voices for uh, the need for dramatic, even revolutionary change to decentralize power, and all three of them promoted and were um, proponents of a, of a spiritual approach. I have had some personal dealings with Russell Brand, but I never got the great privilege of meeting Schumacher. I'm very honored to be here today because he is truly one of my few heroes. In fact, it's probably because of him that my whole life was turned upside down. I, I had come out to this part of the world called Ladakh, or, or Little Tibet, in 1975. And I was a linguist by training. I had come out as part of a film team. I was only going to be there for six weeks. I fell in love with this remarkable culture and place very similar to Bhutan and to, to central Tibet. And uh, my husband and I, who's also here, we've also worked in Bhutan over a five-year period. But in Ladakh, when I arrived in, in 1975, I encountered people who emanated a joy and a vitality, a joie de vivre like I had never experienced. And I also became aware that this place, which had just been opened up to development, and that's how we, we came out as among the first people, uh, was going to be developed in a direction that was clearly very destructive. And I happened to come across Schumacher's Small is Beautiful while I was in Ladakh. And I think if I hadn't read his book, I might never have had the audacity to start writing to the Indian government pleading for a different type of development, a Gandhian style development inspired by Schumacher. And I, as a woman trained as a linguist, I don't think I would have had the audacity to start laying out an alternative agenda if it hadn't been for Schumacher. And that took me and my whole life down a very different path uh, and it's a path which has remained completely true to the uh, inspiration and to, for me, the very, very clear message from Schumacher. And there, central, of course, is small is beautiful, is scale. I believe that, as we've heard earlier this morning, many people share this perspective, we really need a big picture perspective in order to create the sort of holistic, connected movement that can really start taking us in a direction towards nature, towards working with nature. Now, for me, what does that mean? As a primary, primary um, reality is that nature is diversity. Every single human being is unique and individual. Every blade of grass is unique and individual and changing from moment to moment. How can we really truly work with that diversity, that principle of life, if we continue to go in a direction of top-down centralized systems? And I'm afraid that I see the internet as one of the major tools of that centralization that furthers a top-down, centralized, monolithic view of the world. I haven't dared to say this in the English-speaking world for the last uh, some 30 years. I wrote a book called Ancient Futures. I wrote in the 80s, and it originally came out in Swedish and Danish. And in those versions, I warned, of, from my perspective, I was saying that the last thing we need today, 
Look at what Schumacher is saying. Look at what Gandhi is saying. Look at the message from Rachel Carson about the need for a much more holistic and grounded understanding of our impact on the natural world. The last thing we need is a centralized tool of speed and reductionism. I know what I'm saying is very controversial, and I know that I am now completely dependent on the internet. I think we all are, uh, and my whole organization is now operating through Skype and on the internet. So I'm not suggesting that we should be looking at the internet from the perspective that says, well, if I as an individual am using it, I can't critique it. I can't come forth with an analysis that would help us to move away from what today is ever-increased dependence on the internet. So I think this is probably the single most important issue right now, is how we use the internet to bring us in, uh, in the direction that we all want to move. How can we make use of it while quickly moving away from the sort of dependence that is happening where almost every parent is worried about the impact of Facebook on their children. I hope you all know that um, there are more and more studies coming out about how young children feel depressed and undervalued after getting off Facebook. There was recently a report where a five-year-old girl says, when I'm on Facebook, I feel sad. I don't feel as pretty as. It's happening with, with these tools, these so-called social media tools that many people are now describing as anti-social media, is that young people are internalizing what the media used to do, which was to present this image of perfection, these perfect role models, these stereotypes whom never, no one can ever live up to. Now young people are taking selfies of themselves and, and uh, portraying themselves as having these incredible, wonderful times, looking very sexy and very beautiful, and their friends who look on feel um, less, less beautiful, less sexy, less exciting. It's an incredibly important uh, reality that we really need to be looking at. It is also a reality that if you really <laughs> listen to what Satish was saying about the soil, the soul and society and the deep connections that we feel in our face-to-face -face encounters, that Jonathan was talking about, inspired by David Abrams, the full-bodied sensuousness of being in the world and of really moving beyond this dualism of spirit and body as separate. That wholeness requires the wholeness of face-to-face -face interactions. So many people are now realizing that they, in, in front of their screens almost the whole day, that they find the experience draining, and that when they have those face-to-face -face relationships and interactions with people and with the natural world, they feel energized. This is how we evolved. We evolved in nature and in community and living community. So I, I really hope that we collectively can start looking at the arrangements that are happening at a global level that are pushing us in a direction that takes us away from that face-to-face -face experiential relationship with nature and with others. We need to look at the arrangements at the global level that are actually making it virtually illegal to live the way we should be living. Those arrangements absolutely centrally have to do with trade and finance treaties. And it's been a very, very difficult thing to try to keep warning about these treaties now for the last almost, almost 40 years. There was a period, um, well, let me put it differently. Right now, I want to ask how many of you are familiar with the problem with the TTIP treaty? 
That is really good news. That's really good news. That's a very, very high number, and it is changing. At this very late point, what is getting out to more and more people is that these trade treaties, which many people thought of as, well, in the media it sounded as though, well, nations are getting together to negotiate new trade treaties, and of course it's good for our economy to be competitive globally and to trade more, and so if these treaties were failing and countries couldn't agree, it was thought of as something rather sad and unfortunate. What we were not articulating in the media, because the media wouldn't let us, is that these treaties were actually about a relationship between nation states and an interlinked group of banks and corporations that were asking for more and more freedom. So free trade was, is and was an agenda for giant mobile traders and corporations. It goes way back, but it became particularly sort of crystallized with the Bretton Woods institutions. So after the Second World War, when the IMF and the World Bank were set up, so was the GATT, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade. And that agreement was about allowing big business, a freedom to go in and out of individual nation states. That freedom today has translated into treaties where governments sign away our rights and literally say, yes, you may sue us if we do anything to protect the environment or our citizens that will impede your profit. That even threatens your profit, your anticipated profit. So already now a Swedish nuclear power company is suing Germany for 3.7 billion euros because Germany decided to phase out nuclear power after Fukushima. France has been sued for increasing its minimum wage. Uh, Australia is being sued. Um, by cigarette companies for their cigarette packaging. And it turns out that these giant cigarette companies who know that smoking is going down in the West are threatening tiny countries like Togo, saying, if you don't let us market cigarettes to your 10-year-old children with sexy packaging and advertising, we will sue you for hundreds of millions. We can't ignore this. This is, this is centrally part of what we believe we need to collectively, together, work to resist. So we talk about resistance and renewal. The resistance part right now, centrally, centrally, is resisting the power of very, very big global corporations and banks and the incredible pressure they exert on our governments and on our society. As Adam was saying, this process of using big business and advertising to turn us into consumers, this process is something that goes way beyond the earlier roots of our crisis. The earlier roots have to do with the shift in worldview away from a belief that we are a part of nature into a reductionist worldview where we saw ourselves as separate and able to control. That worldview grew into something that became a vast corporate trading system. Now those very big monopolies have uh, continued to shape the direction of our economy. They they literally uh, had discussions about how are we going to get people to consume more? I mean, once they have certain things, they're not going to want to just keep buying and buying. But there were other economists who said, oh, yes, we can. We must make that hamster grow. A hamster doubles its weight each week. <laughs> the hamster we saw in that really, really good little film clip. That hamster is still growing, and then it's growing in the form of a few enormous monopolies, and 
Some of the biggest are now internet billionaires and firms like Uber that employ far fewer people than all the fleets of taxis and so on in different local and regional economies employ far, far fewer, fewer people and have far more economic power. Maybe worst of all, and this is really difficult to talk about, is that as part of the process of trade and investment deregulation, what happened is that we have allowed banks and financial institutions to create money more and more freely. That has included the sort of nonsense that's gone on with derivatives and banks. And apparently, it's all really hard to get your head around, but this is not just some um, you know, grassroots conspiracy theory. I mean, this is something that many economists are writing about. I hope that you will look at our website, Local Futures. We have links to many other organizations. Economists like David Corton, uh, well, Neff, in any case, is right here in the UK. There's also now in the US a new economy coalition. And some of the best economists include Gar Alperovitz. I don't know if you would have heard of him. He's part of that new economy coalition, but he and someone named Gus Beth, they have also recently set up a, a new project that they call the next system. Because really, this is probably the best language beyond saying a new economy. Maybe we need to say a new system. Because the economy is not just, as Schumacher just said in that quote, it goes way beyond it. There's a link between the money and the creation of the money. What type of schooling, what type of science, what type of energy, what type of technology we employ. So the journey from knowledge creation to the creation of money and the energy and technology in between, that system is what we need to look at. And in the final stage of the money creation, it is madness what's happening. We're allowing, as a society, we're allowing banks to create money as debt to our governments. Our governments, as you probably know, the US debt is bigger than any other debt. And the discussion we have about Greece in the media is so fragmented and so misleading, we end up believing that it's all because these Greeks are so corrupt and so irresponsible. No, we are all irresponsible because we allow our entire system to be run by debt and debt to private banks. I only found out, I was concerned about trade and finance treaties for the last 40 years, having seen the early impact on, on Ladakh of conventional growth and development. And I only found out about the BIS about two or three years ago. How many of you heard about the BIS? There, I think one person. The BIS apparently is the biggest, most powerful bank in the world. And it stands for the Bank of International Settlements. And it's the bank that apparently gives the marching orders to what we believe to be our national banks, like the Bank of England or the Federal Reserve Bank of the US. But in actual fact, the way it works, they are, our governments are in debt to them. They are setting essentially the agenda. This has got to be changed. A friend of mine named Ellen Brown, an economist and a lawyer, she um, has basically started in the US a public banking movement. The idea being that it should be we, the people, determine the rules for banks and money creation. We determine the rules. We decide how much money to put into circulation. And hopefully, with the help of Schumacher thinking, with the help of ecological awareness, we will understand the inextricable necessary link between how much money circulates and the reality of limited resources. 
the real bank, the real economy is the earth with its limited, diverse resources. So, coming back to the basic principle of life, the diversity of life, for us, it is now clear that we need to localize or die, basically, that if we want to respect life, if we want to respect diversity, we need to shift rapidly in the direction of supporting a multitude of more localized economies. We have helped in our work to get farmers markets and local food things started around the world, primarily just by putting out some books and films and public speaking. But we've seen, we helped to start one of the first new farmers markets here in Bath in uh, about 1992 or something. We started the first local food thing here. We actually started the project at the Soil Association to promote local food, also in the early 90s. And it is wonderful to see how these local food projects are growing around the world. And there's so much happening in Bristol, but still I'm afraid if we were to do an honest study, we would find that something like only 10% of the food consumed in Bristol comes from the region. Because of the deregulatory trade treaties, most countries are engaged in importing and exporting larger and larger quantities of I virtually identical products. The UK exports about as much milk and butter as it imports. The US imports um, about uh, 900,000 tons of beef and turns around and exports about 900,000 tons of beef. Now, over these long distances, this increase in transport also means expanding the ports and the airports and the superhighways, a faster, bigger global infrastructure to feed giant urban centers. And in those giant urban centers is where almost all the jobs are being centralized as small farmers, but also small production of virtually every kind not just food, it's in fiber, it's in furniture, building materials. You have building materials being flown back and forth. Ancient, you know, old growth logs being shipped across the world, and again, imported and exported. One of my statistics of about 10 years ago was that to buy a bit, about a square meter of, um, of, a, of a, what's it called, a slate. A square meter of slate in the UK from China cost about a fifth of buying a square foot of slate from the UK. So this import and export also leads to local prices for local products being too high for local people. And you have a pattern where products from the other side of the world cost less than local products worldwide. I first saw this happening in Ladakh where butter was being brought in from the other side of the Himalayas, selling for half the price of local butter. I then studied it around the world. I found butter from Holland in Kenya costing half as much as Kenyan butter. Um, butter in Denmark it was cheaper from uh, Spain and butter from Denmark in Spain was cheaper than Spanish butter. And right in Devon where we were living, Butter from New Zealand cost a third of the price of butter from the farm down the road. Why? Most people are not looking at this from a global point of view. We urgently need to look at the global picture to see why localizing worldwide as a systemic shift toward shortening the distance between production and consumption is the way to adapt to the diversity of the natural world. When you help farmers to sell in a local farmer's market, you suddenly put them into a market where diversity will increase profits. When farmers are locked into the giant supermarket trail, the long distances, those giants impose monoculture. Bigger and bigger fields, larger and larger quantities of animals. The pressure has been 
to produce just as factories produce rubble, rubber balls. So the pressure in the large, long distances is towards monoculture. When you look around the world and work in many different cultures as we have done, what you also will see is that worldwide there is a human consumer monoculture being imposed on young children. And it's leading to, and this is what, uh, what led me to be so passionate about this starting in Ladakh and Bhutan, is that children already age five start saying, oh, I'm not good enough if I've got dark skin and dark eyes and I must bleach my hair to have blonde hair. The sale of very dangerous chemicals to lighten the skin, to lighten the hair, and to sell blue contact lenses is skyrocketing around the world. For a long time I thought this was about the West imposing itself. But then I realized when I went back to my native Sweden that five-year-old girls with blue eyes, blonde hair, and light skin were saying, I'm not going to eat. I'm not thin enough. I'm not as thin as Barbie doll. Seeing the global impact of the global economy is very, very helpful. And I think we need much more north-south exchange to start looking at the global system that's having such a big impact on our governments and on our economies and on all our efforts in terms of what we're trying to do. I mean, one of the, well, I hope there are, there's a whole set. I think I want to write about it as, you know, the 10 ideas that are killing us and the planet. And among those ideas uh, is microfinance. Microfinance was introduced and just spread with great religious fervor. And I was so happy to see that there are a few voices now saying what we've been trying to say for, well, ever since it started. Uh, Jason Hickel wrote an article in The Guardian the other day saying the same thing that we're saying. What we have seen is that most of microfinance has gone to rural areas of the so-called third world. It's brought debt to people who weren't in debt before. It's actually been the long arms of capitalism dragging people into dependence. And Jason describes how these people are not, it's within an economic framework where they're being encouraged to buy consumer products and they end up going deeper and deeper and deeper into debt, into layers of debt. For us, the most frightening thing is that it's also connected to urbanization. People who have studied microfinance have said, well, it hasn't really reduced poverty, but it's helped people move to the city. And actually, the urbanization that we're seeing, which is another of the 10 ideas killing the planet, one of the ideas is that um, cities are the only way to go on a crowded planet, that we actually have a lower ecological footprint in the city than we do in the country. Yes, if you contrast high-density urban living in the West with suburbanized sprawl. Not if you contrast high-density, high-rise cities with most of the villages and towns in the so-called third world. There is a way in which we could bring decentralized renewable energy to smaller towns and villages, and the ecological footprint would be a fraction of what it is when people move into the city. In the city, every pound of food they eat has to be transported. So it's now consumed with gallons of oil. It's consumed with layers of plastic packaging, with refrigeration. The totality of the ecological footprint rises. I'm giving you a bit of a taste of some of the, or some of the reasons why we passionately believe that we need this big picture analysis that includes both resistance to continued globalization, and we're pushing really at an open door. How many people would want their government to sign a treaty that says, yes, give Monsanto the right to sue us 
if we do anything to reduce their profit. So resistance, particularly with that systemic focus, and then the renewal. There is so much happening. Resistance and renewal. And in the renewal, we see an amazing proliferation of inspiring, wonderful projects that structurally, systemically, are about localizing. They are about rebuilding those fundamental relationships. They are generally human scale. Think of all those small businesses you know about that were so wonderful, that produced something organic and some wonderful product, but then grew and grew and got bought up by a big multinational. Let's really be vigilant about supporting a very different vision, a proliferation of small scale. Because something is good, let's not follow the hamster path and just keep gobbling and gobbling. Let's really look at how we can have a lot of hamsters that remain alive and vital and connected and embodied. So there's a multitude of wonderful things happening and another one of the ideas that's killing the planet is that we human beings are nasty and greedy by nature and we deserve to extinguish ourselves. Or we are nasty and greedy by nature so let's just give up on hope. No, the proliferation of renewal of localization projects around the world shows so clearly that human beings in human connected webs are doing wonderful things, that our hearts are longing for connection, for real life and blood connection with life. Thank you.